Hello and welcome. My name's Chris Can, Head of Mining Journal Research, and with me I have Hayden Locke, Chief Executive of Maramaka Copper. Hi, Hayden. Hi, Chris. Maramaka released a PEA on its namesake uh, copper project in Chile in August last year. Um, the numbers coming out of that look pretty good. The MPV was just over 520 million. Uh, it's post tax, and the IRR was 33.5%. Uh, and this is based on an open pit operation. It also published some uh, interesting uh, regional interpretation of the geology um, that suggests there could be. A lot more to come, um, and uh, and we have asked some questions around that in an associated podcast. Um, today, we want to just talk about copper, though. Obviously, investors are looking at copper options, and Maramac is one of those. Um, so, looking at getting leverage to the copper price um, at the moment, it's obviously on a massive run. Um, how much of that, Hayden, in your view, is due to um, circumstances and stimulus, uh, government stimulus specifically, um, that's just around um, you know, the, the past few months? And how much of it is a longer term trend, do you feel? I think there is a definite recognition that there's a long term uh, trend and change in or future change in the global economy that's going to be very positive for copper. And uh, I think there's also a recognition that the supply side although it hasn't been you know, massively impacted yet by a lack of new discoveries and, and investment, is going to be more and more affected uh, unless the copper price rises in the future. Uh, I think I've been as surprised as many others in the industry as to how quickly the copper price moved, and I'm sure that there is uh, a degree of speculation that is driving that in the short term. Uh, but we certainly are, as a company, and I certainly am personally bullish over the medium to long term for copper um, and I'm sure there'll be ups and downs as there always are in in copper and commodity prices. Okay I mean looking out to say just this year and the copper pricing um, some of the mail that we're getting across our desk suggests that end users consumers that are looking to do their own stockpiling are sitting back they see a lot of froth in the market at the moment and they're probably waiting for levels around six and a half thousand bucks a tonne um, which they see in the second half of the year. Is that something that you can see as realistic or are you, are you more bullish for um, this short-term period? Oh, I've got no doubt. Uh, you know, Always when you see uh, and think of the, the consumers being trying to run a manufacturing business with an input price that's gone up uh, you know, 30 40% uh, over 12 months, I'm sure that they're sitting on their hands and hoping for a pullback. Uh, whether it happens is is anyone's guess, but I'm sure if if demand starts coming out of the market, then then there will be some weakness in the price. Um, so what are we expecting for the second half of the year? You know, we haven't really given it that much thought because it doesn't impact us uh, on a day to day basis at this point in time. Um, over the medium to long term, which is probably more important for us, we would expect us to see uh, copper prices stay above that level. Um, certainly, you know, we'd be hoping that they'd in the long term, settle around the 350 a pound mark, um, uh, but they may stay stronger for longer. We've seen it happen previously, um, and you just you just never know with uh, what's going on in the global economy with all these stimulus packages coming in, uh, just what impact that's going to have. So when you say stronger for longer and 350 a pound, um, what's driving that? Uh, well. Overall demand, um, as you're changing into this decarbonising economy, I think the, the the general consensus is that the uh, the decarbonisation, electrification of the world is definitely here to stay. And uh, the own, you know, really, if you look at it from a decarbonising perspective and what can actually conduct electricity, your choices are aluminium or copper, really, or maybe silver. Uh, well, silver is incredibly expensive uh, and aluminium has a very high carbon impact. So what does that leave? It leaves copper. So copper is going to become incredibly important and there's been quite a few people who are a lot smarter than me writing notes about the future of copper as one of the most important commodities uh, in, in the future economy that we're going to be pushing forwards. And I think in the short term, it's being driven by supply disruptions. And so we're seeing, uh, you know, in the world's biggest copper producer, Chile, there are disruptions that are being occur occurring as a result of labor, which we've discussed in a previous uh, podcast, uh, but also, uh, you know, a, a general lack of new projects coming into production. Um, there will be a wave of uh, projects that come in in the next couple of years, but in, in the medium term, the cupboards are pretty bare unless the copper price goes up. You mentioned some research notes um, coming out. Something that we saw recently from Goldman Sachs um, suggested that uh, copper was the new oil 
I think that was the headline, um, and that uh, prices of around fifteen thousand bucks a ton were on the horizon. I mean, is that ridiculous? Uh, well, I'm obviously the people at Goldman Sachs are a lot smarter than me, smarter than me, and so who am I to argue with their uh, pontification about where copper prices are going? Um, it, it, I think if that occurs, then there will be a lot of new projects that can come into the market, and and I'm sure that will eventually have an impact on price. Um, you know, I think we're not planning for that scenario. Our plans are more around a, a, a you know a sub four dollar a pound copper price, and so we certainly make all of our decisions based on that at this point in time. Um, and I think the benefit of this project is it's low capex and it's low operating cost means we really are not driven by copper price in terms of our decision making process uh, to take this project into development. Um, obviously, it's nice to have a higher copper price because we make more cash. Uh, which we can return to our shareholders, but the decision-making process is less impacted by the uh, by the those so- sorts of notes that have us all dreaming about what it could be. And what about the labour issues that you talked about? Um, throw in their declining grades as well. Um, you, you know, we're talking about higher prices will therefore necessarily be required to um, bring lower grade projects um, on you know, in, into the into the stream. What kind of levels do you see um, with that supply demand balance? Um, what, what, where do you see things settling out, say over maybe two or three years when you guys are looking to come online, and then maybe projecting out further if we uh, if we take it as read that you'll find more uh, more tonnage and and Maramaca and that region will be producing for a lot longer. Yeah, it's an interesting thing the incentive price for new mining projects because. The, to start a new mining project, the incentive price takes into account the return on investor capital. But once you've sunk that capital uh, and you're in production and you no longer have to worry about it, then what matters is how much are you are you profitable on a year by year basis. And so, to get the projects into production requires one copper price. But once they're in production, and assuming they have a long mine life, uh, then the then the break even price is different. And so, you know, I think the incentive price. To get a lot of copper projects is certainly higher than uh, $3.50 a pound copper, but I think the long-term, sort of medium to long-term price is probably right around that $3.50 a pound copper uh, price, which is a fantastic price for a, for a project like us. We hear a lot about um, the huge uh, numbers of reserves that the major copper producers have up their sleeves. Um, does, is that going to actually, on the on the other side of the argument, is that going to put a cap on on where prices could go to and potentially stop it before we get to those levels where all those new projects might come on. Yeah, I think that that's been history has shown in in many commodities that uh, when you see a huge spike in price, uh, you see a lot of new projects coming online and racing to get into production, and that naturally has an impact on on the overall uh, strength of the commodity price. And once they're in production, everybody holds on by the by their fingernails to stay in production. Um, and so that it'll certainly put a cap on it, but we've got to take into account that there is a strong demand thematic coming through already, and it's going to accelerate, we think, in the next couple of years. And the timelines to get mining projects and specifically large scale copper porphyries uh, into production is quite significant. And so it's not as simple as just turning on new supply. Um, you know, some of the majors do have significant pipelines of copper projects. Uh, so Anglo-American has a has a great pipeline of copper projects. Others don't, like Rio Tinto has very few. And so, you know, really, I think uh, there are certainly new projects that can come online, but uh, there's not that many in the hand. There's not many many brownfield expansions that can really uh, step up to meet this uh, new wave of demand that everybody's expecting um, over the next five six years. Hayden Locke, thanks very much for your time. Thanks, Chris.